Well, thank you, uh, Jimmy, for that warm welcome. Um, if you're surprised to see me, I'm equally surprised to see you this morning. Uh, I volunteered to come along with Val. Uh, I hadn't been home here for a while, and uh, I think it was about five years ago we spoke here one night at um, Harvest, uh, some sort of a festival you were having, and that's the last time I'd heard him preach, but uh, I was able to come back this time, and uh, I was really, really surprised last night. I was out with my wife and friends when I got a call around about nine o'clock, asked me would I step in in the morning, and I thought I meant to drive or something because he said he was doing the driving, but no, it was to do the preach. But I'm very, very happy to do so. Uh, whenever I came in, Jimmy says, goodness me, he even looks like Val, which I don't know if I appreciate that, or I don't know if Val will appreciate that. But you may have noticed we still, we have the same dietitian and it's not doing either of us any good. So he was talking to me last night, he was talking to me this morning at 10 o'clock, and he sends you his very uh, best wishes and prayers. He will be with you, God willing, next Sunday. And his wife, Eileen, uh, they got her a bed sometime during the night, so she's in hospital, and he's back in the wee house there in Balamani. So it's a pleasure to be here. Val and I have been friends for many years. Uh, he was a pastor in Port Stewart Baptist, for a number of years, which is my home church. So um, if you put up the first slide, normally I'm based in England, in um, Lancashire, in Preston, um, and a church called Tanderton Christian Fellowship. There it is. So if you know the Lake District or Manchester or Liverpool, we're just on the outskirts of that. It's an inner city church. It's quite a small church. Um, the estate would have about 15,000 people in it, and they're very much cramped on top of each other. So there's lots of challenging social issues. There's lots of dysfunctional behavior. There's lots of brokenness. And it's an opportunity very much to share uh, the good news of Jesus and to bring hope into people's lives. And um, we have been able to do that very, very successfully over the last number of years. We've seen something like an excess of 500 people come to faith in Christ, which has been amazing. We've seen families changed. We've seen addicts released from their um, addictions. We've seen people miraculously healed, and yet we understand that God doesn't always heal. Um, we had challenges, significant challenges, through COVID, because every time, if you looked at the news, they're reclassifying uh, the worst areas. We always managed to be in the worst areas, so we weren't allowed out of our homes, basically, for the most of a couple of years. Um, we've had good times, but we've also had challenging times. Quite often when there's blessings, there's buffetings, and so we've had our share of that. I myself have been attacked a few times by, by people, but I've always survived it. Um, but we thank God for the work that's been done over there. I also, uh, the next slide, there's the church inside. We're always meeting for fellowship and for food and celebration. Next one. And I do an incredible amount of work outside of the church building. An awful lot of what I would be doing and the church people would be doing would be away from the church. So I've been a governor, a chair of governors in the local school for eight or nine years. We do stuff in the states. And we're always looking to build bridges rather than build walls. So we we'll always try and make connections with the people. Next one. Yeah, there's some more. And next one. And I also, um, I do some work out in Spain. I haven't been out for a couple of years, but most summers I do a couple of weeks out there. And I go to Myanmar, which is Burma, which is the far side of the world. It's five and a half thousand miles away in there. I speak to colleges and to ministers who are training and qualified. And it's an amazing privilege to be in that persecuted church where people are coming to you and you're speaking to them. And a few months later, tragically, some of them have lost their lives for the belief in Christ. And it's a country well worth praying for. Um, the military have taken over, so they've closed the borders down. So I'm not allowed to go back in there again. But I was going out a couple of times a year at stage. And... Um, I was really enjoying the work. Now, it's hot. It's 38 degrees. You do something like 50 sermons in five days, which is hard work in that heat. But God's blessing is really amongst those people as they work amongst the Buddhists and the 
radical other people out there who are very, very anti-Christian. So it's a country, if you see it in open doors or some of those, look it up and read about it and pray about it. Next slide. Beautiful in some respects. Next one. But they're controlled. They tell you where to stay. They follow you. They listen to you, etc., etc. Next one. Uh, there's no Ulster buses or right buses or whatever it is out there. It's very, very old. And finally, if you've had a nice breakfast, there would have been my breakfast out there. Fish head noodle soup for breakfast. A great way to start your Sunday off, isn't it? See people volunteering for that. So um, I have been out there a number of times, and one of the people who I travel with sometimes is a retired Elam pastor, albeit he's from England, uh, Phil McKinnon. So it's always a pleasure uh, to work out there with him. So I'm back here in Northern Ireland for a few months. I'm intended to take a break after COVID, and the guy who is responsible for my next move, he's off ill, so I'm sort of in limbo here, but it's worked out very well uh, for us here today. And um, my wife and I, she's from the North Coast, we're enjoying um, the weather and the break up there. Now, I do have one slight problem. At the beginning of July, I lost my hearing in my left ear. So I can't hear, and it's very hard to judge what level my voice is. So if you don't mind, if I'm, getting, if I'm shouting too much, could you please, could you just try that for me? Try that. Okay, good. And if I'm too quiet, just encourage me. Okay? And if I've gone on too long, just point me towards the door out there. Could we turn, please, if you've got your Bible, we're going to look at two passages. Um, we begin in Ephesians 3, and then we're moving to Exodus 2. We're just reading a couple of verses here from Ephesians 3. I'm reading from the NIV. In verse 14... Paul writes, for this reason I kneel before the Father. In other words, he's prostrate here. He's really wanting to come before the Father with all seriousness, with all intention. This is something that is very, very important. This isn't a quick passing prayer. This is a guy who is really, really sincere and how he's approaching his Lord and Master. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. That essential Holy Spirit inner power that we all need. And then I go on that we may be able to grasp, someone prayed about it there, we were singing about it, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And that's the love that sustains us, is that amazing, incredible love. To know that this love that it surpasses knowledge, that you be filled with it to measure of the fullness of God. And then this verse here. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within you, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. And really what I would want to think about, if you have the next slide there, immeasurably more. What's immeasurably more look like in our lives? Do we settle for immeasurably less? Now, I'm speaking here in a very um, luxurious position, if you like, because I don't know anything about you or almost nothing about you. So I, nobody can say I'm coming along and I'm saying I'm judging this person or this or that or the other. I can only say from my own experiences in England and what I've been experiencing over there with church people, I'm a Baptist minister. Um, but for other denominations, I will speak regularly in Anglicans or Methodists, whatever. Um, do we settle as the modern 21st century church for immeasurably less? Do we put... God in some sort of a wee box and restrain him? And does that limit our prayers? And again, I've never been to your prayer meetings, so I can't judge. Is our faith 
maybe a wee bit anemic. And as we pray, are we focusing on the ground beneath us rather than the huge horizons that God has set before us? You think of the verse in um, Mark where uh, the guy comes for healing for his son and Jesus says to him, everything is possible for the one that believes. And his response, I believe, help my unbelief. Immeasurably less. Maybe that's why we live in a society and in a culture that has increasingly become immoral. And the truth is a throwaway comment. And we have lost our positions. The Christian modern 21st century church has lost its position to influence. We need to turn this situation around and go back to thinking about that verse, to him who is able to do immeasurably more. Not a wee bit more, (laughs) immeasurably more. We need to become people that see possibilities. What if, what if God turns up in that terrible situation? What if, and I mean the, the Bible, I um, was listening to someone else preach a few weeks ago and they were quoting, but God, that phrase, but God is mentioned more than 4,000 times in the Bible. This was going to be a tragedy, but God. This was going to happen, but God, and but God. God keeps turning up when God's people Keep that view of God. He can change finances. He can mend marriages. He can save souls. He can bring prodigals home. Do we have that expectation? Whenever I went to the church in Preston, they had never seen a mission. They'd never done a mission. Some of these people were in their 80s, and they'd been Christians for many years, and they'd never once seen a mission, they'd heard of missions, but they had an expectation of seeing God at work. And in their prayers, they were sincere and they were tearful and they were broken. And they didn't really understand, but I took it to be a work of the Holy Spirit moving in them. And they would sit in prayer meetings before the service and during the week, and they would cry. And they would confess sins for previous things that were wrong in the church and for things that were wrong in other churches and for things that were wrong in the nations. I began looking at them and I thought, well, Lord, I mean, I come from a Port Stewart Baptist is quite a a well-organized professional church and these people are almost at the other end of the spectrum and they're quite amateurish and how could God work there? But God's not looking on the outside. He's looking on their hearts And with them, he had real heart attention. Began to work through them. Began to work through lots of events. And began to work through in lots of one-to-one, slow-building relationships with people. As I said in the introduction there, uh, addictions broken. People healed with one lady who had been... um, Five children four different partners and had been alcoholic for 14 years, drinking three bottles of white wine a day during those 14 years and was ill and dying in church. My wife and I was called in in the middle of the night and um, even though she'd heard the gospel before, she hadn't really heard it and she didn't understand it. So I excused myself. Helen, my wife, led her to faith. And we thought, and the doctors thought she's going to die by morning. But Helen started ringing around people. And I know this doesn't always work like this, but for whatever the reasons God heard, and God responded in a positive way. And sometimes her family, including myself and wife, were called to her bedside that she was now dying. Six times she came back from that. I went on a short break to North Wales. She was unconscious when I left. She was still unconscious when I come back. She was unconscious for 13 years, for 13 weeks. And yet we kept praying. We had that expectation where there's life, there's hope. What's immeasurably more here? Can this lady come through this? 
What about the children? How are we going to, how are we going to work with the children? And I was the one who was going to have to tell the children about their mum. She came through it. And about three or four months later, she was well enough to get home. And she went back about a year later and asked, uh, could she, every major organ had failed her in her body. Could she uh, have a liver transplant because her liver had been ruined with all the alcohol? So they did all the tests and they said, no, you're not getting a transplant. And she was quite upset and the doctor, the consultant says, you haven't heard why we're saying this. And she says, okay. And this, their, their reply to her was, well, we can't explain this, but your liver has completely healed itself. God of the immeasurably more. I lost a sister to cancer when she was quite young and people prayed for her. So God doesn't always answer in the way that we expect, but where there's life, there's hope, and we keep praying, what if God turns up here? But God can intervene. Whenever we are in England and Wales, it's a statistic that's not published that much because it's bad news. 98% of people in England and Wales will never at any stage in their lives cross the threshold of a church building. 98%. And that's not to say that the 2% that do are believers. But at least they're willing to cross the threshold. And is that the 98%'s problem? Well, it's their problem, but is it their fault? No, it's not their fault. It's the church's fault. It's all of the church's fault. Tozer said once, the world is perishing for the lack of knowledge of God And the church is famishing for want of his presence. When we have the Holy Spirit working through us, people start to come in. People start to be moved. Things start to happen. When we see the mess, God sees more. Whenever we see opposition, he's seeing opportunities. So immeasurably more. I was thinking how to illustrate this. I want to turn back, please, if you've got your Bibles there, back to Exodus 3. Back to Exodus 3. I'm going to look at 3 and 4. And I'm mindful of the time, so you don't need to start pushing yet. And I will keep going through this relatively quickly. That's an awful way to get a, a drink of water. I tried to put my hand through the glass here in case you're wondering what I'm doing here. Exodus 3. So Moses is at the burning bush. We know the story of Moses, his background in Egypt, um, been looked after, been brought up in Pharaoh's um, household, and then killing one of the Egyptians. And so he's been out in Midian, uh, and he's been there. He's had 40 years in Pharaoh's um, household. He's had 40 years in Midian. And now he's out here tending the sheep, and he sees this unusual sight. It's this bush that's burning up. Now, that's in itself not unusual out there, but the fact that this kept burning, it actually didn't burn away, as it were. So he goes over to him, and God called to, in verse 4, God called to him from within the bush, and he says, Moses, Moses, and Moses says, here am I. So Moses, so Moses is interacting to begin with with God. Moses hears God's voice. As people, as church, we're challenged to hear God's voice. Should it be through song? Should it be through prayer? Should it be through the the preaching of the word, exposition of the word? Should it be the still small voice? Should it be looking out in creation? As God's people, we want to be hearing God's voice. Moses said, here am I. God says, take your, off your sandals for the place you're standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. So Moses hides his face because he's afraid to look at God. In verse 7, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. First thing is, 
God sees. God communicating and God speaking. And whenever we're trying to do a measure bit more, whenever we're facing challenging situations, whether they be within our family or our neighbors or whatever, God sees. I have indeed seen the misery of my people. And then he says, I have heard them crying out. So God not only sees, he hears because of their slave drivers. And then he says, and I am concerned about their suffering. So God knows or God feels. So God sees, he hears, he feels. And then verse 8, he says, so I have come down to rescue them or to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians. So God acts. Do you think about this? The people are out there. They're, in, they're struggling. They're crying out to God. God's chosen servant happens to be a long distance away in the middle of the wilderness. God speaks to him. He hears his voice. And then we see that God sees, God hears, God feels, and God's act, God acts. And then verse 10, God says, now, So now, go. I am sending you. So God's got a plan. Whenever we have situations that are not going well, in the background, God will always have a plan. Now, I will send you is basically God's plan here. And verse 11, Moses isn't too keen on this idea. And he says, but who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? In fact, he's appalled. He's saying, no thanks. Here am I. Send somebody else. I'm not up for this. But God is insistent, and he says, God says in verse 12, I will be with you. And then he starts to give him a series of signs to prove that he'll be with him. And verse 13, Moses says, suppose I go. And so he's still not convinced, even though he's heard God's voice, even though he's been led to this, even though God's shown him a different way and a different plan, he's still not convinced all about this. So the rest of that chapter is him being told, you're going to go. And he's going to give him the details of how he's going to go. So for time's sake, we're going in then to chapter 4. Moses is still not happy here. And he says, but what, verse 1, what if they do not believe me or listen to me? And said, the Lord did not appear to you. Verse 2, then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Now that is a fantastic question. What is that that's in your hand? What is it in your hand today that God has put? Wherever we are located, whatever we are doing, God has something, put something unique in our hands. And sometimes we think, well, this, is, this needs to be done, but I'll have to get one of the church elders or I'll have to get... Uh, the next pastor in or whatever. And God's saying, actually, what's in your hand? I've given you enough here. It's not past the parcel. God's saying, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? And so the first thing is, Moses replies, a staff. Verse 3, God says, the Lord says, throw it on the ground and it became a snake. And Moses ran away from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. So Moses grabs the hold of the snake by the tail and it turns back into the staff. This, says the Lord, is so as you may believe that the Lord, the God of the fathers, has appeared to you. So the first sign is the staff in his hand, throws it to the ground, it's a snake, and he's able to grab it. And what's God saying at that point? The snake was the symbol of Egypt. And God's saying, whatever powers that you're going to come up against, whatever the government, whatever authority on earth that you're coming up against, I have power and dominion over them. Just like this, over all earthly kingdoms. And today, uh, and we do, many people have anemic faiths. We are so fearful of speaking out in culture. And I don't mean to say that in a brash, unloving on Christian or ungodly way, we do have to show love, we have to show patience and all this, but we do also have God's living word that's true. We must have the ability to hold on to that and not be overwhelmed by the what ifs 
of government, the what-ifs of people who are anti-Christian, who do not want to know about this, who have no morals. God is over all earthly kingdoms. Verse 6, the second sign, the Lord says, put your hand in the inside of your cloak. So Moses puts his hand into the cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous, as white as snow. So put it into your cloak again, and when he did, he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If you read around, you'll find that leprosy wasn't discovered a couple of hundred years ago, but it was actually discovered 1,500 years before Christ, and that it was the, a disease that the Egyptians feared most. It was called the Egyptian disease. And what God is saying there to Moses, what he's saying there to his people, what he's saying to us today is that whatever the disease, whatever it is that we fear most, he is still the authority over it. When he took the, the hand out, it was, as clean as, it was as clean and pure as ever. God had removed the leprosy. God is in charge of all, so we must live lives of freedom, not lives of fear. Verse 8, we go into the third sign. And the Lord said, if they don't believe you or pay attention to the first, they may believe the second, but if they don't believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it in dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Now, the relevance of that is the Egyptians referred to the Nile as the sacred Nile. So whenever God turned the water that was the life giver that they channeled all through the country to provide nourishment, whenever he turned it into blood, God saying, I and I alone am the author of life. I and I alone are the giver of life. So we've no reason to fear. Moses has no reason to fear back then. We have no reason to fear now. Moses still goes on saying, well, I've never been eloquent. I'm slow of speech. Verse 11, God says, who give human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? And he tells them to go. And Moses is still struggling to go. So we move on to verse 19. Verse 18. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him. So Moses has got the message that he's gone back to Egypt. And he says to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. So Jethro, his father-in-law, says to him, go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all those you wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them in a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And here's the key part of that wee verse. And he took the staff of God in his hand. So he had two chapters worth of complaining that he wasn't the right man, that he couldn't do this, everything under the sun. And at the end of it, God says, you are the man. You've got a staff in your hand. What's in your hand? I'm giving you nothing else you don't get any fancy new equipment, nothing else. What was in his hand was enough. So we think back then to where we began. The God who is able to do immeasurably more, and I don't know personal situations here, but whatever you're facing, God is able. We are called to live lives of triumph. And I know, and I'm faced with many, many, many pastoral situations. I could stand here for the next three hours and tell you one horror story after another, after another, after another, of poor choices that people have made in lives, of tragic outcomes. But God, God comes into the middle of these things. God is able there are no limits to God. He's already given us all that we need. The, the folk out over in Preston used to wear we t-shirts, we are the hands of Jesus or we are the feet of Jesus. And quite often all he asks us to do is to go alongside someone 
and simply be there with them. I'm not sure what it's like here culturally, but in England, there are many thousands and thousands of lonely people. People who their families have abandoned, people whose society seems to have abandoned, people who are craving to know about this love that we're singing about and praying about. God has given us all that we need. And he asks us to imagine what is beyond the unimaginable. He asks us to look upwards and to keep looking upwards and to keep trusting in him because he is a good, good God. He wants the best for us. It's his will that none should perish. None. But all should inherit eternal life. May we be a people who live by that and who have that sense of expectation to see him at work in our lives and indeed the lives of those around us. Let me close in in prayer before um, the guys come back to sing. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that it's the living word. Thank you that a story thousands of years old, still has real meaning and application in our lives today. I thank you for this fellowship here. I I understand the, the vacancy and I understand these things can take longer than sometimes we um, expect. But Lord, I also understand that you're a good God and you know exactly how long it will be before the next pastor comes along. You know exactly the ups and downs, the high points and the low points. Thank you, Lord, that you have plans for this fellowship. You have plans for every individual who's been listening to me this morning. Thank you that your God is on the move. And even though we might live in a society that increasingly turns its back on any form of Christianity, Lord, you scoff at those people. Thank you that we've all read to the end of the book and we know there will be a new creation. We know that you'll live with your people. We know that there'll be no more tears, no more sorrow for the old order has been passed away. Help us as we remain here to be faithful in all that we do. Help us to be faithful to you. And as we close, we do continue to remember our dear friend and brother Val and his wife, English Lord. May they sense your peace today. May they sense that the God of the measurably more is doing something in their lives. Bless them indeed. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.